go. Judges chapter 16. Children, if you are in kindergarten and below, you may leave now to go to kids' worship time. Judges chapter 16. Today is Palm Sunday, which begins Easter week, Holy Week. And one of the most devastating events that happened right before the crucifixion was when Jesus was betrayed by Judas. But what's even more excruciating is when the apostle Peter denied Jesus. How many times? Three times. Luke records it this way in Luke 22, 60 through 22, 62. But Peter said, man, I do not know what you're talking about. And immediately while he was still speaking, the rooster crowed. And the Lord turned and looked at Peter. And Peter remembered the saying of the Lord, how he'd said to him, before the rooster crows, today you will deny me three times. And he went out and wept bitterly. He wept bitterly. Verse 61 says, Jesus turned and looked at Peter. Jesus was probably being led to another room, and there was that one moment where Peter's gaze and Jesus' gaze met. And the way that Luke records it, it was a sharp gaze. It was a laser-sharp look. It was a penetrating look. It was a look of conviction, but it was also a look of love. One of the earliest Christian paintings in the world is called the Christ Pantocrator. It means Christ Lord Almighty. It's on display in St. Catherine's Monastery near the base of Mount Sinai in Egypt. It's from around the 500s, one of the earliest Christian paintings. And really what it is, it's a famous portrayal of the two eyes of Christ. There's the stern right eye of judgment, and then there's the left eye that's weeping, the eye of mercy. Now, Luke does not to tell, tell us precisely how Jesus looked at Peter, but it was an intense look. It was a serious look. It was a look of conviction. Jesus pierced Peter's soul with a convicting gaze. Yet at the same time, it was a look of love. It was a look of mercy. Jesus pierced Peter's soul at that moment with a look that probably said something like this. You can communicate a lot in a look. Peter, yes, you've disappointed me. Peter, yes, you've failed miserably. But I still love you. I will forgive you. You will repent. This is not the end of you, Peter. Yes, this is a moment of weakness where you're going to deny me three times, but I will restore you. And what does Peter do after Jesus gazes at him? He goes out, and the Bible says he wept bitterly. In the original language, it's like a violent wailing, an uncontrollable sobbing. And when you think of Peter, and you think of his failure, you're reminded of all the times you've failed Jesus. And you may wonder, does he truly love me? Have you ever wondered if you've sinned beyond the reach of God's forgiveness? Has your life been one act of failure after another in your commitment to Jesus? How many of you have ever pledged, don't raise your hand, but how many of you have ever pledged, I will never do so and so again. I'll never do it again. I'll never look at pornography again. I'll never gossip about my coworker again. I'll never lash out at my anger at my spouse again. I'll never disobey and lie to my parents again. I'll never sneak out of the house and sleep with my boyfriend again. I'll never cheat on my taxes again. I'll never punish my child in selfish anger again. I'll never do it again. And then you do it again. John 21, Jesus restores Peter publicly in front of all the other disciples, confirms his love for Jesus, confirms his love for Peter, I'm sorry, this man who sinned grievously. 
And so the restoration of Peter after denying Jesus three times is a wonderful encouragement to all of us who have failed Jesus. And we need to experience restoration. We need to experience amazing grace. Now you may wonder, why am I bringing up Peter's denial this morning? I thought we're talking about Samson. I thought we're talking about judges. As I was preparing this message, I thought, there's a lot of similarities between Peter and Samson. Two men that were servants of the Lord who sinned grievously, but then God restored by His grace alone. You're probably more familiar with the restoration of Peter than you are with Samson. But here's the the message from Judges chapter 16. Here's the big idea of what Judges 16 teaches. It's simply this. No true believer who fails Jesus is beyond his amazing grace. Have you ever failed Jesus? Have you ever thought you've sinned beyond the reach of his amazing grace? I've got good news for you. There's no true believer here today If you've failed Jesus, you're not beyond his reach of amazing grace. And let's see it unfold in the life of Samson. This is the end of Samson. It's taken us four chapters to look at this man's life, and we finally get to the end here in Judges chapter 16. And this unfolds for us in three scenes. Here's scene number one. For lack of a better term, the prostitute from Gaza. I mean, I'm I'm telling you guys, this this is Judges. We're in... Weird territory here. So let's read verses 1 through 3. Samson went to Gaza, and there he saw a prostitute, and he went into her. The Gazites were told, Samson has come here, and they surrounded the place and set an ambush for him all night at the gate of the city. They kept quiet all night, saying, let us wait till the light of the morning, then we will kill him. But Samson lay till midnight, and at midnight he arose and took hold of the doors of the gate of the city and the two posts and pulled them up, bar and all, and put them on his shoulders and carried them to the top of the hill that's in front of Hebron. Okay, that's interesting. Samson's strong again. He goes in and sees a, a prostitute that he wants to have. What's Samson doing 45 miles from home down in Gaza? He's doing what's right in his own eyes. We don't even know the name of this woman. We just know that she's a prostitute. But here's something that's very interesting about chapter 16. No mention whatsoever of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit's not rushing upon him. The Holy Spirit's not evident in Samson's life. He is here acting upon appetite in his own brute strength. So that's scene number one. Now, remember, he, this is the second woman that he's had eyes for, okay? The first was from Timnath that we looked at a few weeks ago. This is the second one, an unnamed prostitute. But then we get to scene two, and we do know her name. So scene two is called the hairdresser named Delilah. And hairdresser's in quotation marks there. So let's find out scene two here. Let's keep moving. Verse four. After, after this, he loved a woman in the valley of Sorak whose name was Delilah. And the lords of the Philistines came up to her and said to her, Seduce him and see where his great strength lies and by what means we may overpower him, that we may bind him to humble him. And we will each give you 1,100 pieces of silver. So Delilah said to Samson, Please tell me where your great strength lies and how you might be bound that one could subdue you. And Samson told her, If they bind me with seven fresh bowstrings that have not been dried, then I shall become weak and be like any other man. Then the lords of the Philistines brought up to her seven fresh bowstrings that had not been dried, and she bound him with them. Now she had men lying in ambush in an inner chamber, and she said to him, The Philistines are upon you, Samson. But he snapped the bowstrings as a thread of flax snaps when it touches the fire, so the secret of his strength was not known. Then Delilah said to Samson, Behold, you've mocked me and told me lies. Please tell me how you might be bound. And he said to her, If they buy me with new ropes that have not been used, then I shall become weak and be like any other man. So Delilah took new ropes and bound him with them and said to him, The Philistines are upon you, Samson. And the men lying in ambush were in an inner chamber, but he snapped the ropes off his arms like a thread. Then Delilah said to Samson, 
Until now you have mocked me and told me lies. Tell me how you might be bound. And he said to her, If you weave the seven locks of my head with the web and fasten it tight with the pin, then I shall become weak and be like any other man. So while he slept, Delilah took the seven locks of his head and wove them into the web, and she made them tight with the pin and said to him, The Philistines are upon you, Samson. But he awoke from his sleep and pulled away the pin, the loom, and the web. And she said to him, How can you say I love you when your heart is not with me? You've mocked me these three times, and you've not told me where your great strength lies. And when she pressed him hard with her words day after day and urged him, his soul was vexed to death. And he told her all his heart and said to her, A razor has never come upon my head. For I have been a Nazarite to God from my mother's womb. If my head is shaved, then my strength will leave me. Then I will become weak and be like any other man. When Delilah saw that he had her told her all his heart, she sent and called the lords of the Philistines, saying, Come up again, for he has told me all his heart. Then the lords of the Philistines came came up to her and brought the money in their hands. And she made him sleep on her knees. And she called a man in and had him shave off the seven locks of his head. Then she began to torment him, and his strength left him. And she said, The Philistines are upon you, Samson. And he awoke from his sleep and said, I will go out as the other times and shake myself free. But he did not know that the Lord had left him. And the Philistines seized him and gouged out his eyes and brought him down to Gaza and bound him with bronze shackles. And he ground at the mill in the prison, but the hair of his head began to grow again after it had been shaved. This is the third woman that he has loved, or should I say, lusted after. And her name is Delilah. What does Delilah mean? There's, there's, there's different nuances of what the word Delilah means. It can mean to flirt. It can mean hair. Or it can mean of the night. So if you take all these words together, Delilah means a long-haired flirtatious woman of the night. How would you like to have that as a nickname? You remember that old Pointer Sister song from the late 70s called Fire? Romeo and Juliet, Samson and Delilah. Baby, you can bet a love they couldn't deny. My words may split, but my words, they lie. Because when we kiss, ooh, fire. I think that was really written by Bruce Springsteen, but fire. Delilah is a woman that's going to bring the fire. Proverbs 6, 27 through 29 says this. Can a man carry fire next to his chest and his clothes and not be burned? Can a man walk on hot coals and his feet not be scorched? So it is he who goes into his neighbor's wife. No one who touches her will go unpunished. She's bad news. The long-haired flirtatious woman of the night. She's fire. And the political leaders of the Philistines bribe her with 1,100 pieces of silver say to her delilah we need to know the source of samson's strength so we're bribing you with money go find out what his strength is and so she's driven by money she's driven by power she's driven by fame if she turns samson in she will be the national heroine she will be rich and famous and so she did seduces him four times and the first time samson's playing with her he says well you just need to tie me up with fresh bowstrings Now, Samson is playing a game with her, but Samson is slowly moving into depravity here because he forgets something. He forgets that his strength comes from the Spirit of the Lord, not himself. He's beginning to play a dangerous game here because he's beginning to forget that he's a Nazarite, that his strength comes from the Lord, and that his strength is not inherent in himself. Does God owe him his strength? Is he entitled to this strength? Okay, that's the first attempt, and we know it doesn't work. The second attempt, okay, so she hounds him again, and he's like, okay, this time, number two, new ropes. Get, get, some, get some new ropes. And so she has him tied up in ropes, and what happens? He busts free of the ropes. And she gets mad. She's like, why are you mocking me? Why are you making fun of me? Why are you doing this? And then in verses 13 and 14, Samson's getting close to the edge because he's starting to deal with hair. If you weave my hair together, then I'll be weak. So he presumably lays down and then has his hair like in her loom 
kind of like spun up with these, these seven locks of hair. And he's playing a dangerous game because he's getting close to the edge. He's not fully giving away the secret, but he's, he's talking about hair. And we know the hair is the source of his strength. Again, he's not relying on the Holy Spirit. He's taking for granted that his power is something that God just is entitled to give him. And I wonder how often can we abuse God's gifts and take for granted the blessings God gives us as if we're entitled to those things. Have you ever felt entitled? Well, God just owes me this because he just owes these to me. Well, God owes us nothing. God owes us no blessings. God owes us no, no gifts. God, God gives those to us because he loves us and he's sovereign, but we're not entitled to those. And maybe Samson's thinking, well, I'm entitled to be strong because after all, God has to give this to me. And so she presses him and she presses him. And finally, the final attempt here in verses 15 through 17, she nags him. We find out there in verse 15, How can you say I love you when your heart is not with me? You've mocked me these three times and you've not told me where your great strength lies. And she pressed him hard with words day after day and urged him until his soul was vexed to death. And then verse 17, he told her all his heart. In other words, he bared his soul to her finally in that moment of weakness. Okay, you got me, Delilah. You've pressed me hard. You've hounded me. You've nagged me. You've pressed me. I give up. I'll tell you my secret. Now, I love the way Andrew Fawcett, he's an old um, Scottish commentator. Listen to what he says about this passage of Scripture. He says, quote, When we, like Samson, lay down our heads to sleep in the lap of temptation, our spiritual enemies are never more wide awake. Samson strangled a lion, but he could not strangle his own lust. He burst the ropes of his enemies, but not the cords of his own passions. He laid his head down in her lap, fell asleep, and the guy came in and cut his hair. What should have Samson done all along with these women? 2 Timothy 2.22 so flee, run, flee youthful passions and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace along with those who call on the Lord from a pure heart. So Samson was mighty in battle. He could kill hundreds. He could strangle a lion. But he could not strangle his own lust. He could not say no to sin. He succumbed to the temptation of Delilah. And verse 20 is probably the most tragic statements in this passage of Scripture. He did not know that the Lord had left him. Now, we need to be very careful here because from the full teaching of the Bible, no true believer can fully or finally fall away from a state of grace. You cannot lose your salvation. True believers will persevere to the end. And that does not mean that if you're a true believer that you can't backslide at times that you can't rebel, or that you can't fall deeply into sin. And what God can do is God can decide at a point in time to remove not your salvation, but God can remove His presence in your life to say basically this, Dear child of God, if you want to go the direction you want to go, go for it. I'm hands off and see where it gets you. Sometimes God may discipline his children as a means to love them so when it says the lord left him it doesn't mean that somehow samson lost his salvation or somehow samson wasn't a believer it just means that god was going to take his hand of grace in that moment off of samson and he would have to undergo discipline and we know the writer of Hebrews says this in Hebrews 12, 5 through 6. Have you forgotten the exhortation that addresses you as sons? My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor be weary when reproved by him. For the Lord disciplines the one he loves and chastises every son whom he receives. The Lord disciplines. And how does that discipline look at times? On Wednesday nights, we're going through the 1689 Second London Baptist Confession, our confession of faith. 
In chapter 4 on God's providence, there's an interesting statement in paragraph 5 that we often as Christians aren't that familiar with, but let me just read it to you. The perfectly wise, righteous, and gracious God often allows His own children for a time to experience a variety of temptations and the sinfulness of their own hearts. He does this to chastise them for their former sins or to make them aware of the hidden strength of the corruption and deceitfulness of their hearts so that they may be humbled. He also does this to lead them to a closer and more constant dependence on Him to sustain them, to make them more cautious about all future circumstances that may lead to sin and for other just and holy purposes. God may for a period of time allow you to go your own way. And that's his means of discipline. So that you see your corruption, you see your sin, you, you, you understand what it means to walk in rebellion. And God says, if you want to walk in rebellion, I'm going to let you for a season. That's going to be my discipline. And then you're going to have to face the consequences of that. You're not going to lose your salvation. You're not going to lose a place in heaven, but you're going to be disciplined. And it may be painful. And so in one night, Samson's life comes crushing down with a razor to his hair. A man who's always done right in his own eyes, what's the stinging irony of what happens to him? A man who does what's right in his own eyes is what? He's blinded. Do you see the stinging irony? Where where, where is he punished? In his eyes. His eyes are gouged out. What has Samson been living for his entire life? I'm driven by what I see. I see a pretty girl. I see a pretty girl. I see a pretty girl. I see things. I want things. I'm driven by sight. Well, now he's blind. He can't be driven by physical sight. So you have to ask the question, maybe, just maybe, now that that Samson is blinded physically, can he truly see spiritually the condition of his own heart? Without physical eyes to see, does he have the spiritual eyes to see the reality of his sin? This man who had tremendous freedom is now in bondage. The man who had the highest calling in Israel, this judge, is now grinding flour in a prison, the lowest of all tasks. And then in verse 22, there's an interesting little detail. The Philistines weren't that smart, were they? What do you notice about verse 22? The hair of his head began to grow again after it had been shaved. Shaved it once, thought that was good. What should the Philistines been doing while he was in prison? Send the, send the barber in every day. No, they just let his hair go back. Now, obviously, his hair is not the source of his strength. The Lord is the source of his strength, but the hair is the token. The hair is the symbol of that strength. So here we have Samson in prison, in bondage, Eyes gouged out at the lowest of low. Now, remember last week, caller spring? I mean, he was thirsty. He thought he was going to die, and Lord provided water out of a rock, but this is dire. His eyes have been gouged out. He is in chains, and he's at the lowest of low. And so let's just see how the last scene plays out. Scene three, victory through extreme failure. Victory through extreme failure. Let's pick up in verse 23. Now the lords of the Philistines gathered to offer a great sacrifice to Dagon, their God, and to rejoice. And they said, Our God has given Samson, our enemy, into our hand. And when the people saw him, they praised their God. For they said, Our God has given our enemy into our hand, the ravager of our country, who has killed many of us. And when their hearts were merry, they said, Call Samson, that he may entertain us. So they called Samson out of the prison, and he entertained them. They made him stand between the pillars. And Samson said to the young man who held him by his hand, Let me feel the pillars on which the house rests, that I may lean against them. Now the house was full of men and women. All the lords of the Philistines were there. And on the roof there were about 3,000 men and women who looked on while Samson entertained. Then Samson called to the Lord and said, O Lord God, please remember me. And please strengthen me only this once, O God, that I may be avenged on the Philistines for my two eyes. And Samson grasped the two middle pillars on which the house rested, and he leaned his weight against them, his right hand on the one and his left hand on the other. And Samson said, Let me die with the Philistines. 
Then he bowed with all of his strength, and the house fell upon the Lord's and upon all of the people who were in it. So the dead whom he killed at his death were more than those whom he had killed during his life. Then his brothers and all his family came down and took him and brought him up and buried him between Zorah and Eshtael in the tomb of Manoah, his father. He had judged Israel 20 years. So the pagan Philistines, the lords, the, the, the elite, throw a party in honor of Dagon, their god. Dagon's a half-fish, half-man god. Actually, Dagon is the father of Baal, the other false god. So they bring Samson in for the night's entertainment. Let's make sport of him. Let's make fun of him. Let's mock this man whose eyes have been gouged out. This guy who was big and strong that tied those foxes together and and did all this stuff. Let's make fun of him. Cruel and vicious. And it's so pathetic that Samson can't even see to, to come in. The little boy has to guide him, and he has to feel along the pillars to even know where he's at. But what's really going on here? Is this about Samson being made fun of? Is there something deeper going on? What's really going on here is the reputation of the living God. By making fun of Samson, they are making fun of Samson's God, the Lord. Our God, Dagon, has done all. We're going to bow down and praise Dagon. We're going to bow down to our God, a carved image. How do we start out the worship service this morning? Isaiah 42, 8. I am the Lord. That is my name, my glory I give to no other, nor my praise to carved idols. God's not going to share his glory with a half man, half fish God, Dagon. Who's going to get the last laugh here? Are they going to laugh at Samson and Samson's God, or is God going to get the last laugh? In verses 28 and 29, we see Samson's final prayer. And it is a prayer to the Lord after extreme failure. Samson's humbled. He's blind. He's a slave. And he's out there as the brunt of all their jokes. Again, it's more dire than what was last week when he was thirsty out in the desert. And Samson's final prayer is faith in God's sovereign grace. Finally, under the hand of extreme discipline, Samson's at the lowest of low, the worst of failures, eyes gouged out, in chains, being made fun of. He finally repents and casts himself at the mercy of God. Samson accepts this deserved discipline from the Lord and with godly sorrow cries out to the Lord with a prayer. And notice what he calls God. It's not a generic God. Verse 28, Samson called to the Lord, all caps in your Bible, Yahweh, and said, O Lord God. That's Adonai Elohim. So he uses three names of the Lord. Yahweh, Adonai, Elohim. In other words, I'm praying to the sovereign God of the universe. And what's his prayer? Honor me, God. Elevate me, God. Give me my eyesight back, God. Let my name be honored, God. Now, what's his prayer? Remember me. God, would you please remember me? And just one more time, just one last time, would you give me strength? I know your strength all along has come not from me, but from you. I am weak. My eyes are gouged out. I am nothing. I am repenting. Would you please, just this one last time, God, Would you do your servant a gracious act and let me, let me, let me glorify you in just one last act here to kill the Philistines. Now, that was God's plan all along, wasn't it? That was God's secret sovereign plan all the way back in chapter 15, verse 4, that God would do an act to bring about the end of the Philistines. So, Samson is weak, he's failed, he's sinned grievously, and he cries out to the Lord, humbly. Now, you must have missed something, or maybe I missed this when I was reading it, but I was reminded of it, back in Judges 13, 7. What did God say to his mom before Samson was even born? 
the angel. He said to me, Behold, you shall conceive and bear a son. So then drink no wine or strong drink and eat nothing unclean, for the child shall be a Nazarite to God from the womb to what? To the day of his death. God said, Till the day you die, Samson, you are mine. I'm setting you apart from birth until the very day that you die. You're a Nazarite. Doesn't really matter about the length of your hair. It doesn't matter if your eyes are gouged out. It doesn't matter if you're in slavery. I'm the sovereign Lord, and I have a plan for you, Samson. Until the day that you die, you are mine. So God promises that Samson would be a Nazarite to the day of his death. God never forsook him. God promised to empower him to the very end. And, and you're confused because you think, man, Samson's a lustful guy. Samson's a proud guy. Samson is just like this incredible hulk of a man that was so self-centered and so lustful. Why would God do that? Why would God honor him in the very final stages of his life as such a kind of scummy guy? As a matter of fact, he's listed in Hebrews as one of the champions of the faith. Did you know Samson's name shows up in the Hall of Faith? Hebrews 11, 32-34. And what more shall I say, for time would fail to tell me of Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, of David and Samuel. So Samson's like two, two names away from David and Samuel and the prophets. Who through faith conquered kingdoms, enforced justice, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the power of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, were made strong out of weakness, became mighty in war, put foreign armies to fight. What do we see about Samson's death there in verse 30? What does it say about Samson's death? And Samson said, let me die with the Philistines. Then he bowed with all of his strength, and the house fell upon the lords and upon all the people who were in it. So the death whom he killed at his death were more than those he had killed during his life. In this moment of weakness, with his eyes gouged out as a slave, in these final moments, Samson was more powerful and more victorious than any time than he was alive. In these final moments of weakness. Now, who were the people that were killed? This was the elite, the royalty, the, the royalty of the Philistines, the bigwigs, the political elite of the day. What were they doing? Well, they were playing and laughing and making fun. They were bowing down to a false god. They were merry. They, they didn't think there was any problem. What's this Samson, this guy that's all tied up with his eyes gouged out? We don't have to fear him. He's not a problem. We can eat, drink, and be merry and make fun of him all day long. And how did they die? Well, you say they died because Samson pulled the house down on top of them. Yes, technically. But how did they die? Because Samson prayed. It was God who did this. Now, we're going to address an issue after Easter. We're going to do a little break from, from, from Judges, and we're going to talk about spiritual warfare in the coming weeks where we can tear down strongholds ourselves. 2 Corinthians 10, 4 through 5. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but have divine power to destroy strongholds. We destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God and take every, captive, or every thought captive to obey Christ. Now, this is Palm Sunday, the beginning of Holy Week. It leads us to Good Friday, where you think about the cruel death of Jesus on the cross. And so I want us to think deeply about Samson's death here and how it points to Jesus. There's a lot of similarities between Samson and Jesus. You say, now wait a minute. Between Samson and Jesus? Samson was betrayed by someone very close. Delilah. Jesus was betrayed by someone very close. Judas. Samson was mocked and made fun of by the Gentile onlookers. Jesus was mocked by the Roman soldiers and onlookers. Samson spread his two arms out on the pillar and had the weight of that building come crashing down upon God's enemies. Christ was suspended on the cross with his hands out. And when he died on the cross, he toppled the enemies of Satan, death, and sin 
those enemies came toppling down by his outstretched arms on the cross. Colossians 2.15, he disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them. 1 John 3, 8, whoever makes a practice of sinning is of the devil, but the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. So Samson, with his arms outstretched, the walls came toppling down. Jesus, with his arms outstretched on the cross, when he cried out, is finished. Satan and his armies came toppling down. But you see, that's where the similarities end. The servant of the Lord, Samson, died. And you find out in verse 31, he was buried in a tomb. The story's finished at the end of chapter 16 of Samson. That's, he's done. He's dead. He's buried. Jesus died as a servant of the Lord and was buried. But what do we know next week? He rose again on the third day. And Jesus is alive today as the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And so Jesus gave his life as a ransom for many. Jesus died on that cruel cross to set us free from sin. And so I started my sermon today by addressing Peter's extreme failure and denying Jesus three times. At the end of Judges 16, you have Samson's extreme failure at the hands of Delilah. So what does the failure of Peter and Samson Show us about God. No true believer who fails Jesus is beyond His amazing grace. 2 Timothy 2.13 If we are faithless, He remains faithful, for He cannot deny Himself. Many times we're faithless. Many times we walk in rebellion. Many times we fail. We look at Peter and we see ourselves in a mirror. That's me. Opening my big mouth. Denying Jesus. Rash. You look at the mirror and you say that, and you look at Samson, that's me. All the things that Samson had going on. And God still loves his people. Not because we deserve it, but because God has made a binding covenant in blood, the blood of his son that says, I will never leave you or forsake you. Now, that is never an excuse for us to continue to sin. That is not, hear me very clearly, it's not a free pass for you to say, I love sinning, God loves forgetting, forgiving, let's keep this relationship going on for a long time. No, that's never an excuse for us to continue to sin our hearts out because after all, God will forgive me. You want to know why God is patient with you? You want to know why God shows you grace? You want to know why God is slow to anger with you? Well, the Bible tells us why. It's so that it will lead you to repentance. Romans 2, 4. Do you presume upon the riches of his kindness and forbearance and patience, not knowing that God's kindness is meant to lead you to repentance? So as we prepare for Easter this Holy Week, let us love Jesus wholeheartedly and at the same time flee from all temptation as we seek to glorify Him. Let's praise Him for His amazing grace. And let me just ask you a question. As you think about Jesus this week, does He capture your heart? Are your thoughts focused on Jesus? Does Jesus grip your imagination? Are your hands ready to serve Jesus? Are your lips eager to speak of Jesus? Are your feet willing to follow Jesus? We're going to sing this song in just a moment, and we're really going to have a time of response this morning. We haven't really had a time of response in a long time with just an opportunity for you to come before the Lord, but come to Jesus, rest in Him. Are you helpless? Are you guilty? Caught in shame for all your sin? He pursues you. 
to forgive you. Rest in him. He has paid for every failure. Mercy flows in endless streams. Come and follow. Freedom calls you. Rest in him. I'm going to call us to rest in him this morning. I can think of no better way to prepare our hearts for Easter week than to rest in Jesus. So would you bow your heads this morning? Are you hopeless? Are you guilty? Caught in shame for all your sin. He pursues you to forgive you. Rest in Him. He has paid for every failure. Mercy flows in endless dreams. Come and follow. Freedom calls you. Rest in Him. This morning, Lord Jesus, we want to come and rest in Your grace. Lord, there may be some in this room this morning that feel like they have failed so miserably that they do not deserve your love. That they've sinned one too many times. They've failed one too many times. And Lord, they're under a weight of guilt and shame this morning that's overbearing. So Lord, we pray that we don't look inside of ourselves for the answer. We don't look to the world for an answer. We come to Jesus for the answer. And we rest in you, our Savior. So Lord, we want to have soft hearts as we prepare Holy Week. We want to think about forgiveness and love and the cross and the resurrection. And we look at Peter, we look at Samson, and we look at ourselves. And we're thankful for amazing grace. We're thankful that no true believer who's failed you, Jesus, is beyond the reach of your amazing grace. Would you give hope to the hopeless this morning? Would you give help to the helpless this morning? And would you give heaven to the hell bound this morning? only through Christ alone. So I'm going to just ask you to keep your heads bowed this morning. The praise team is going to begin to sing. This is just a time for you to do business with the Lord. We're just going to sing this together as a church family. So praise team, why don't you go ahead and start us and we'll just continue in a time of prayer.